Piers Morgan is a British journalist, broadcaster, and television personality known for his work on various UK and US television programs. He gained prominence as a tabloid editor in the UK, notably for the Daily Mirror, and later transitioned into television, hosting shows like Piers Morgan Live on CNN and Good Morning Britain on ITV. Morgan is known for his outspoken opinions, confrontational interviewing style, and active presence on social media, which often spark debates and controversies. Mehdi Hassan is a British-American political journalist, broadcaster, and author. With a background in political science, Hassan has made a name for himself through his work with various international media outlets, including Channel 4, Al Jazeera English, and MSNBC. He is known for his sharp analysis, debate skills, and in-depth interviews on his shows, such as Upfront on Al Jazeera English and The Many Hassan Show on MSNBC. Hassan's work often focuses on issues related to politics, religion, and international relations, and he is recognized for his articulate and robust questioning of public figures and politicians. Well, Mehdi Hassan is a broadcaster with a big bite. His MSNBC show was abruptly cancelled at the end of last year, but not before his criticism of Israel's war in Gaza had sparked plaudits and protests around the world. He's best known for his tongue-lashing monologues and probing interviews, which have made him a big hit online. There are also people no. that your government has no. killed. You accept that, right? You've killed children, or do you deny no, that? No, I do not. I do not. December. Yes, you did, Vivek. This, is, this is awkward for you because you me, did. I've got the tax returns in front no, of my it's face. Not awkward. And the former president of the United States today threatened America's Jews. Do you believe that if elections are held on time in October of this year, that your besieged party can still win and that you can still be prime minister again? Surely that's a pipe dream now. I, I think it was not core to communism, no. So when Karl Marx was talking about religion being the opiate of the masses, that was just a throwaway line. Look, they, That's fine. Can look can, at me and the American say, people Steve can be lied, well. and the president can be a liar. There's no contradiction between those two statements. Well, now, he's joined the US Guardian, using his first column to call Israel's offensive a genocide. Also started his own media company, Zateo News. His New York Times bestseller, Win Every Argument, was noted to be written before he'd appeared on this show. And now Mehdi Hazan is uncensored. Mehdi, how are you? Piers Morgan introduces Mehdi Hassan with a flair that's as much about setting the stage for a journalistic duel as it is about highlighting Hassan's career and controversies. This introduction isn't just a simple welcome, it's a strategic move by Morgan, laying out Hassan's credentials, controversies, and confrontations in a manner that primes the audience for a fiery exchange. By detailing Hassan's critical stance on Israel, his impactful yet abruptly cancelled MSNBC show, in his online popularity, Morgan effectively frames Hassan as a formidable opponent, not just a guest. The mention of Hassan's big bite and tongue-lashing monologues teases the expectation of a spirited debate. This setup, alongside references to Hassan's confrontational interview style and provocative statements, doesn't just introduce a guest, it anticipates a clash of titans. Morgan's approach underscores his own reputation for not shying away from controversy preparing viewers for an engaging and potentially contentious dialogue. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you for that introduction, Piers. <laughs> we've, we've had a few ding-dongs on, uh, on X, formerly Twitter, over the years. Uh, recently, I've noticed a pattern where you've started a few tweets saying, I hate to admit this, but I agree with Piers Morgan. Yeah, you've said some sensible things about the conflict in the Middle East. You've said some sensible things about Islamophobia. I feel like you've matured over the years. <laughs> uh, I've been following what's happened with you with great interest. And as somebody who was at CNN and left, left there pretty abruptly myself a few years ago after a, a series of very uh, lively debates with members of the NRA about gun rights in America, you know, I, I could see what happened with you. And we'll come to that a little later. But first of all, how are you enjoying the freedom of your new life? Very much so. Um, I'm someone, as you said, who likes to speak out. Uh, I'm known for speaking very freely. And look, it's great to have your own enterprise, start your own media company. I'm 44 years old. I've worked for the BBC, for Sky, for Al Jazeera English, for NBC, for HuffPost. Uh, and it's good to actually be my own boss for a little while and to be able to, especially at a time, Piers, when the world is going through so much. You have the, the war in Gaza, you have an election in the US, you have the rise of fascism globally. There's a lot I want to speak about 
both online and in my shows and in my writing. And, you know, it is good to be uncensored, including on this show. It certainly is. It's great to have you. Um, let me just take you back to October the 7th. I want you to imagine, and it's a bit of a leap, I, I admit, but I want you to imagine that you are the Prime Minister of Israel when that atrocity happens in Israel. What do you do? Well, isn't that just a cosy tea party with a side of dynamite? Piers and Mehdi, once Twitter frenemies, now trading compliments like they're at a diplomacy summit where the dress code is sharp wit and the currency is mutual respect. Mehdi's nod to Piers' matured insights? That's the olive branch wrapped in a newspaper. And Piers, oh, ever the provocateur, casually tossing Mehdi into the hypothetical hot seat of Israeli prime ministerhood. If journalism had a buddy film, this dialogue would be the plot twist, complete with explosions of insight and slow motion walks away from fiery debates. Strap in, folks, it's a bumpy ride through the world of uncensored media with these two at the helm. That's a great question. So short answer is I resign because I'm the responsible for that attack. I'm the one who botched security at the border. I'm the one who propped up Hamas with money from Qatar over the years and allowed them to be propped up as a way to divide the Palestinian people. I'm the one who's had millions of my own people on the streets for months protesting against my authoritarian reforms to the judiciary. So I have some shame. I have some self-respect. I have some honesty. And I say, I quit. Let someone else do this because I've failed for 20 years. Oh, many just took two seconds to come up with this. Taking us on a whirlwind tour of hypothetical political integrity that's as rare as a quiet day on Twitter. Imagine that, a leader taking full responsibility for their actions, then stepping down with dignity. In the real world, that's about as common as finding a unicorn in your backyard. Many's response isn't just a mic drop, it's a reality check wrapped in a what-if scenario, leaving us all wondering, what if leaders really did that? Truly, a moment of satirical brilliance that makes you chuckle and ponder all at once. OK, Netanyahu did not do that. And interestingly, although the majority of Israelis would like him to go, they also want him to finish the job in destroying Hamas. There's, yeah. there's not much ambiguity in terms of how Israelis feel about the, the mission plan. Um, but there's obviously a lot of concern mounting around the world about the scale of Israel's response. And that's really what I, I guess my, my question was alluding to. Yes. I, I'll be honest, I've said this a lot on my, on my Uncensored show, that I felt a real moral quandary. You know, I can go back over tweets I've done back in 2014, where I said that Israel's response to uh, provocation by uh, Palestinians at the time was bordering on terrorism. You know, I have somebody who, when I was editor of the Daily Mirror, opposed the Iraq okay. war before, during and after, very vociferously. And I think that aged pretty well, that campaign. Um, I'm somebody that when the Qatar World Cup happened, you know, I sprang to defence of Qatar's right to host the World Cup and exposed a lot of Western hypocrisy. And yet, when it comes to this yes. particular conflict, I, I feel genuinely conflicted, for want of a better phrase. And, and the point of my conflict is so this, really, is that the reason I asked you that question about if you were the Prime Minister of Israel, it's very, very difficult to know how any Prime Minister of Israel could have responded in a particularly different manner to the way that Netanyahu did. Putting aside all the reasons that you say he should have resigned, and by the way, I broadly agree with him. So, um, in terms of the Israel people, the Prime Minister at the time, the response to what happened that day was going to always have to be enormous, wasn't it? Pierce's response is like watching someone navigate a minefield on a unicycle, impressive, risky, and you can't help but watch in anticipation of what's next. He skillfully acknowledges the complexity of the situation, revealing his own moral conflicts and past stances, which adds layers to the debate like a political lasagna. It's a nuanced dance around the fiery topic, landing on the point that leadership in crisis is as clear-cut as a foggy day in London. Pierce essentially says, it's complicated, with the finesse of a diplomat tiptoeing through a diplomatic quagmire. This exchange is turning into a masterclass in how to keep a hot debate simmering without letting it boil over. So you're right in terms of the emotional response. It was going to be enormous. And I would take us back to 9-11, Piers. You mentioned Iraq. Mm. After 9-11, there was an emotional response in the US that something had to be done. 
right? There's, you know, there's the famous yes minister dialogue. Something has to be done. This is something. Let's do it. And we invaded Afghanistan, which didn't solve the problem of terrorism, made it worse, punished innocent people who had nothing to do with 9-11. And you'll remember at the time, Piers, both parties in the United States supported going into Afghanistan. Only one member of Congress, not Bernie Sanders, Barbara Lee of California, voted to oppose that war. Two decades on, many people would say she was vindicated, even though she was an isolated voice, and she was going against a tidal wave of opinion from liberals and conservatives said, we have to do something. And I get that. After an atrocity happens, people want to do something. But the best leaders, the most strategic leaders, the most moral leaders are the ones who can take a pause, take a breath, and say, are we going to make the situation better or worse? Are we striking out strategically or just for the sake of vengeance and revenge? And you talk about Israeli prime ministers having to do this. Look, they didn't have to do it on this level. I think a lot of Israelis, despite supporting Netanyahu, would argue it didn't have to be done like this. There are different ways to retaliate against Hamas. The irony is no Israeli government has done it like this before. This is the greatest death toll for Palestinians of any war in Israel's post-1948 history. So the fact that he did it like this was unique. I mean, look, the statistics speak for themselves, Piers. You know them. You've said them on this show. Yeah. The level of killing, the number of kids killed. Uh, you have one former UN official saying this is the highest kill rate in the world since Rwanda, right, of any mm. conflict since Rwanda. Do not tell me that the only response uh, to a brutal attack on civilians in Israel on October the 7th was to produce a conflict that had a kill rate equivalent to Rwanda's. Sorry, no, I don't accept it, that. Many's response is a deep dive into the ocean of historical precedents and the whirlpools of emotional reactions to tragedies. With the precision of a historian and the passion of an advocate, he navigates through the treacherous waters of doing something in response to crises, questioning the effectiveness and morality of such actions. Many isn't just throwing shade, he's casting a spotlight on the stark difference between reactive measures and thoughtful leadership. His reference to Barbara Lee's lone stand against the tide showcases a nuanced argument for restraint and wisdom in crisis management. This isn't just a rebuttal, it's a call for a paradigm shift in how leaders respond to atrocities, wrapped in a history lesson we didn't know we needed until now. It's like he's saying, let's not repeat the mistakes of our past, with the earnest hope that someone, somewhere, is taking notes. Here's what I would say, playing devil's advocate, and you might think, I'm literally playing devil's advocate, but I'm going to play it anyway, which is, all that is true. The death toll is horrific. The percentage of children being killed is horrific. But I would say, as a caveat to this, that if you think about it from the Israeli perspective, you've got 35,000 Hamas uh, terrorists, and we'll come to whether you think they're terrorists or not in a moment, but you've got 35,000 Hamas soldiers, warriors, terrorists, whatever description you want to call them, depending on whose side you're on. And they are embedded amongst a civilian population where half that population is under 18. How else do you get rid of Hamas if you don't go about it in the blunt, brutal manner that Israel is doing? And if you do it the way they're doing it, how do you avoid the kind of casualty rate of people under 18, given that that's half the population. Pierce's argument here is like walking on a tightrope over a valley of ethical and moral quandaries, trying to balance the horrific realities of war casualties with the complexities of combating embedded militants. He's juggling the hot potatoes of civilian casualties and military tactics, suggesting that the grim situation forces a choice between unpalatable options. This is the kind of conversation that leaves you feeling like you've been through an emotional and intellectual marathon, coming out the other side pondering the profound dilemmas faced by those in positions of power. It's a stark reminder of the brutal calculus involved in conflict zones, where theoretical debates meet the harsh ground realities of warfare. So, three things very briefly. Number one, you do it by not deliberately targeting civilian targets and schools and hospitals and cemeteries and mosques and universities and churches. You don't have snipers shooting at hospitals or Christian women inside a church. That's how you avoid the casualties. Number two, I don't accept the premise of your question that this is the way to defeat Hamas. I think even if I'm an Israeli hawk, I criticize Netanyahu and say, this is not the way to defeat Hamas. This is actually absurd to think you can defeat Hamas in this way. We have 
countless episodes from history that show us this is not how you defeat a guerrilla movement, a resistance movement, a terror group, as you say, whatever words you want to use. In fact, you have Israeli generals saying this can't be done in this way. And number three, look, the reality is Hamas is a symptom of the problem. As long as you treat Hamas as a problem rather than as a symptom of the problem, you're never going to get rid of Hamas. Or if you do, by some fantasy means, get rid of Hamas, you'll just get another version of Hamas because now you've got tens of thousands of orphans. You've got people who've lost their kids, their spouses, their siblings. What, you think they're not going to fight back in the years? to come? You, know, you think they're not going to take well, revenge? Well, that's how I feel. I mean, absolute I, madness to listen, believe. I feel, I feel the same way. I, then I'm we agree. Of... Many's response slices through the debate with the precision of a surgeon, dissecting Pierre's argument with a mix of factual clarity and moral conviction. He's like a debunker-in-chief, challenging assumptions and calling out the flawed logic with a three-pronged approach that leaves little room for ambiguity. Medi doesn't just reject the premise, he obliterates it pointing out the impossibility of defeating a guerrilla movement through brute force and highlighting the cyclical nature of violence. It's as if he's saying, let's not be architects of our own perpetual conflict. Their exchange turns into an unexpected consensus, proving that even the most divergent viewpoints can find common ground in the search for sanity amidst madness. This is the kind of dialogue that could light up social media with both torches and candles, spark for thought and illumination for understanding. So, yeah, I think, bro broadly speaking, I do, because I think you can't kill the ideology. And in fact, all you will do is entrench yep. the ideology, I think. And that's what I don't think Israel have thought through to a, a logical end game, which is you're not going to get rid of the thinking that inspired Hamas, because a lot of people will have suffered such appalling grief with their close family in but the again, way you Piers, described that they're, they're, they're going to want to get revenge. I think you're being a little too generous to the Israelis here. And, and with the greatest respect, I think your questions reflect a little bit of a naivety about what Israel's doing here. You're, you're starting from the premise that Israel is trying to defeat Hamas. I don't accept that premise. I don't believe that's what Israel is trying to do. What do you do think they're trying they to do? Were, they wouldn't be doing it this way. I think they're trying to take back Gaza. I think they're trying to erase the resistance in Gaza. I think they're trying to get rid of the people from Gaza. I think this is their, you know, they've mowed the lawn, as they put it in previous wars. This time they're going in to erase the population. You know, they, you know there's a plausible genocide. Okay, but let me, okay, so, the so let me ask you that. Justice. If right. you listen, hold on, if you listen to Israeli officials, as you know, it's laid out mm. in the South African petition, they are very genocidal in their approach to flattening and burning down Gaza. It's not about destroying Hamas. And if it was about destroying Hamas, why has Netanyahu and Smotrich and others talked about how Hamas is an asset to Israel. Why do they say that openly, Piers? Many's counterpoint swings the conversation into a whole new arena, challenging not just tactics but intentions, and painting a picture of a strategy that goes beyond mere military objectives. He's essentially flipping the script, suggesting a far more profound and, frankly, disturbing agenda. This isn't just about the fog of war, it's about what lies beneath it, the underlying currents shaping the conflict's trajectory. His accusation of a genocidal approach is like throwing a grenade into the debate, forcing a moment of reckoning with the darkest aspects of human conflict. This dialogue has evolved from a discussion into a deep, unsettling inquiry into the very nature of prolonged hostilities and the shadows they cast over humanity's moral compass. Well, he was clearly massively deluded, I think, Netanyahu, about uh, having anything to do with Hamas. I think that Netanyahu's plan was quite straightforward, which was to separate Hamas from the Palestinian Authority and create a split in the Palestinians yes. at an official level. And he thought that that was the best way of preserving security for Israel. He couldn't yep. have been more wrong. I mean, the thing I do want to ask you, you I, I don't think you've called Hamas terrorists. In fact, you've gone out of your way to call them fighters. Do you still think that? Or do you accept that what they did on October the 7th was an act of terrorism on a heinous so scale and therefore you have to call them terrorists? So you're wrong, uh, uh, Piers. Uh, in my very first MSNBC monologue after October 7th, I referred to what happened on October 7th as terrorism. In fact, when I was 16 years old, I wrote a letter to the independent newspaper condemning Hamas bus bombings in the mid-1990s. Uh, so you're wrong on multiple levels. I don't expect you to know about my 16-year-old self, but clearly uh, my MSNBC output is all, for, is all there for anyone to see. So just to be clear, Look, just, to be clear just to be 7th, clear, you, you, it was an act of terrorism and Hamas are terrorists. That's your position. I think, I think the Hamas fighters who went into Israel 
and killed civilians and kidnapped babies, certainly I would call them terrorists, right. just as I call Israeli soldiers who kidnap children and kill children terrorists. I use the terrorist label more freely because otherwise it's just a politicised, mm. empty phrase that we just apply to our enemies. What I would say, Piers, is that I find it a problem, and you, you know this, you've joked about all the memes about you, mm. this obsession with what we call Hamas, which is a question you pose... Let's be honest, Piers, to most of your pro-Palestinian brown guests. You don't ask your Israeli or Jewish or pro-Israeli guests to condemn Israeli terrorism or Israeli war crimes at the start of an interview in the way you well, do. No, Many's response showcases his consistent stance against violence, irrespective of the perpetrator, underlining his commitment to impartiality and labeling acts of terrorism. He calls out the selective application of the term terrorist pointing to a broader issue in media and political discourse where labels are often used to serve political narratives rather than to denote actions unequivocally. Many's mention of his own historical condemnations of violence adds a personal dimension, emphasizing his long-held views. This exchange highlights the complexities of discussing terrorism and violence, where terms are loaded with political implications, and the importance of consistency and fairness in their application. I've been asked, directly, I've been asked directly whether I think Israel are terrorists, and I've said no. So I don't think they are. I think they had a right to defend themselves. The question is the That's scale. Not, that, wasn't, that wasn't the point I made, Piers. No, no, that but, wasn't no, the point I, I made. I, I said when you have Israeli guests no, no, hang on, on. I don't let me, yeah, hang let me on. finish I my sentence. Answer the question. Let me finish my sentence. No, hey, Mehdi, it's not your show. It's mine. I wanted to say that, or the whole interview, by the way. <laughs> so we got that out of the way. That's a joke. I'm joking. But the, the, the point I would make is I, I think that I asked all the pro-Palestinian guests who've come on that question quite quickly, because I think it, it reveals a state of mind. If, like you, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't realise you had in that first piece on MSNBC done that, so I, I take back the suggestion you hadn't, and I'm glad that you have that you have called them that. I don't think you can call them anything else. So the moment you have a pro-Palestinian guest who wants to avoid calling what Hamas did an act of terrorism by terrorists, I think it's very revealing about their mindset, and I think it's the wrong mindset. Here's my problem with that. Why is that not applied to your Israeli guests? I would, I would, be, I would be fine, Piers, if you had Palestinian guests and you begin by asking them, do you condemn Hamas war crimes? Mm. Because what Hamas did on October 7th was a war crime. But then you should start with Israeli guests and pro-Israeli guests saying, do you condemn Israeli war crimes, which have been documented by the UN, mm. every human rights group on the planet. You don't. You had Naftali Bennett, the former Israeli prime minister, on a couple of weeks ago. I watched the interview. Mm. Your opening question was, how comfortable are you with the way Israel's prosecuting the war? Right. Bit of a softball to start with. You didn't ask him to condemn Israeli terrorism, Israeli war crimes, Israeli genocide in Gaza. So a lot of people look at that and they say, I, they get your intention, mm. but it comes across as a bit of a racist double standard. Many's rebuttal brings the conversation to a critical point of media fairness and the importance of equal standards. His challenge to peers on the consistency of questioning Israeli and Palestinian guests cuts to the heart of journalistic integrity, highlighting the potential for biases to shape narratives. By advocating for a balanced approach in addressing acts of violence, regardless of the perpetrator's identity, Many is calling for a more equitable and comprehensive examination of conflict dynamics. His critique isn't just about the specifics of the Israel-Hamas conflict, it's a broader commentary on how media can inadvertently perpetuate inequalities through uneven scrutiny. This moment in their dialogue underscores the ongoing debate about media responsibility in portraying complex international issues. Well, look, I don't think it's a racist double standard, and I think that nobody has given pro-Palestinian voices a bigger platform more consistently since October the 7th than me. Uh, and, I you think you, and if you go I back agree. and look you at have. those interviews, you know, I think that clips get taken out of context and people assume they know what I've said. And often it's completely misleading. I've tried to be fair-minded about it. People do ask me, do you think Israel are terrorists? And I've said no. I don't think they are, but I have repeated... Why? Well, I have repeated... Why? Because I think they... Out of interest, why? Because they were responding to an act of terrorism so heinous, it demanded a massive military response. The question for me that's caused me a moral quandary is what is an acceptably proportionate level of response? And I don't know the answer, but I don't think you can call people responding to an act of terror on that scale terrorists for responding. What you can do is hold them to account. The problem, as you say. The problem if, is, if, is if you go to Gaza, if you go to Gaza, Piers, and you talk to Palestinians, they will say that Hamas were responding. If we play the who started it game, we go back many decades. Well, when, did Israel, have is a when did Israel? When did Israel kill? Uh, over, what we need to have is. Well, hang on. When did Israel to, kill twelve hundred Palestinians? When did Israel kill hundreds of Palestinian it, civilians? When did they kill eight hundred Palestinian civilians in one few-hour period? 
right, in the way that Hamas killed but those Israelis. But that's not Israelis. the definition of terrorism, how many hours you do it in. I can mention many Israeli massacres going back to Sabra and Shatila, which they oversaw, going back to Kibia and Ariel Sharon, going back to Deir Yassin, where rape and violence happened. The point is not to compare atrocities. The point, Piers, is to have a consistent moral principle, which is to say, if you kill civilians for a political cause, mm. you are a terrorist. On that basis, Hamas have committed acts of terror and Israel have committed acts of terror. I think that's only fair to say that. Medi's argument zeroes in on the core issue of defining terrorism and the need for a consistent moral principle when evaluating actions that result in civilian casualties, regardless of the perpetrator. His emphasis on a uniform standard for labeling acts of violence as terrorism, whether committed by state or non-state actors, underscores the complexity of attributing blame in prolonged conflicts. By challenging the selective use of the term based on the actor rather than the action, many calls for an honest and equitable discourse on violence and its repercussions. This exchange not only highlights the intricacies of defining terrorism but also the importance of maintaining a consistent ethical stance in discussions about conflict and accountability. Yeah, listen, you're perfectly entitled to say it. Of course you are. Um, at the Oscars on Sunday, Jonathan Glazer uh, won an award for Best International Film for The Zone of Interest, a movie about uh, the Holocaust. And uh, he's a director. He, he said this when he was on stage. Our film shows where dehumanization leads at its worst. It shaped all of our past and present. Right now, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. Whether the victims of October the... <laughs> Whether the victims of October the 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack on Gaza, all the victims of this dehumanization. How do we resist? Now, that, that prompted a lot of reaction, as you'd imagine. New York uh, Post columnist John Potteret said on X, Jonathan Glazer, you can go bleep yourself and stuff your Oscar up your bleep, to which you replied, cry more. Ben Shapiro wrote an X in Jonathan Glazer's zone of interest. You don't see one Jew. These are the best Jews, according to Glazer, the faceless victims screaming in the distance. Ironically, he's the villain, picking up awards from the bodies of these anonymous dead Jews while ignoring the living ones getting slaughtered in the Gaza envelope by genocidal murderers. Um, listen, you've seen the way that, that debate played out. Interestingly to me, before we get to what Glazer said, I've been really struck by the fact that throughout the entire Hollywood awards season, be it movies, television, music, I don't think there's been a single statement by a big star about the Israel-Hamas war, which is pretty well unprecedented for the biggest bunch of virtue signalers in the world. A, what do you read into that? And, and secondly, on Glazer's speech, was that the right time and place to say it? And what do you think of the reaction from prominent Jews to what he said? Well, let's work backwards. Uh, yes, it was the right time to say it. Why not? And I've been depressed to see that the award ceremony season has not seen anyone mention an ongoing genocide in the Middle East in which 12,500 children minimum have been killed in the space of a few months. So I'm happy he did it. I find the controversy to be uh, manufactured. I find it deeply dishonest. You have people like Meghan McCain uh, and others tweeting that he said he refutes his Jewishness. Just flat false. I'm glad you posted and played the whole clip here because a lot of people have been very sneaky and posting a portion of his statement to make it sound like he was refuting his own Jewishness. What he said, as you, we all saw, is he refutes his Jewishness being hijacked by the occupation, which is how a lot of Jewish people, a lot of young Jewish people, especially in the United States, feel. And that's why so many of us who are critics of Israel say, let us disentangle the political ideology of Zionism being pushed in the occupied territories from Judaism, one of the world's great religions, which is not responsible for the crimes of Benjamin Netanyahu or Bezal or Smotrich. So uh, I think he's been completely smeared. And I hope he sues some of these people. Uh, number two, in terms of Hollywood, mm. pff, for four years of Trump, Hollywood celebrities spoke out against fascism, yeah. authoritarianism, human rights abuses at the border. And now suddenly they've all lost their voices, which tells you a great deal about how this issue uh, is so censored in the US, to use a phrase that you like. Mm. Uh, it's not uncensored. We know that people in Hollywood, in the media, in politics, elsewhere, do feel a pressure not to speak out on this, do get worried about losing career opportunities. Uh, my good friend Mark Ruffalo was up for an Oscar yesterday. I was hoping he'd win because he's one of those bold folks who does speak about Gaza and Palestinians. I know he would have devoted his speech to it. Sadly, he lost to his fellow Marvel character, mm. Robert Downey Jr. But look, it's a real problem that in Hollywood, there is so much censorship at a time when people talk about free speech and artists for free speech. And I'm glad Annie Lennox spoke out. I'm glad Jonathan uh, Glazer spoke out. I just wish more people were. Were you?
Many's critique addresses the broader issues of dehumanization, political ideology versus religious identity, and the selective silence in the entertainment industry on global conflicts. His defense of Jonathan Glazer's speech at the Oscars underscores the importance of utilizing high-profile platforms to highlight human rights abuses, challenging the status quo of Hollywood's engagement with political issues. Many's remarks reveal a frustration with the apparent censorship and fear within Hollywood to address contentious issues like the Israel-Palestine conflict, contrasting sharply with its vocal opposition to other forms of injustice globally. This discussion not only highlights the complexities of navigating political discourse in the entertainment industry but also emphasizes the critical role of public figures in raising awareness about humanitarian crises. You fired by MSNBC, cancelled by them because of what you said about the Israel-Hamas war, as many people think you were. So, just to clarify, I was not fired. Uh, I chose to quit after they cancelled my shows. They did cancel my shows, yeah. yes, and I was disappointed. Who wouldn't be uh, to lose my two shows? Uh, you'd have to ask them why they cancelled the shows. They never said it was about Israel-Palestine. People can speculate. Um, I then decided that, look, it's an election year. I've got a lot I want to say, uh, and I asked to leave, and they very graciously allowed me to exit my contract. You know about cable news contracts, mm -hmm. Piers. But could it, yeah, but could uh, it have been... Many, the reason I'm exit. asking is it could you have been a victim of the very thing you're talking about, which is the censorship driven by big media companies in America, most of whose tentacles end up in Hollywood. I appreciate your questions, Piers, but you're going to have to ask MSNBC, get them on and grill them. I might do that. Um, you Many's departure from MSNBC, framed as a choice following the cancellation of his shows, becomes a poignant illustration of the potential pressures and limitations media figures might face when covering highly sensitive and politicized issues like the Israel-Hamas conflict. His narrative hints at the complexities of navigating editorial lines and the broader consequences of voicing strong stances on contentious topics within mainstream media platforms. This situation underlines the ongoing debate about media freedom, editorial independence, and the potential influence of external factors on news coverage and commentator careers. Many's story, as recounted in this dialogue, serves as a case study in the delicate balance media personalities must strike between personal conviction and professional constraints. You also said about Joe Biden that he was the most impressive president of my lifetime. As in The Guardian, uh, a calendar year ago. Do you stand by that? Peers must be feeling what Jordan Peterson felt in this clip. Gotcha. I'm just trying. I'm just trying to work that out. I mean, ha, gotcha. You have got me. You have got me. I'm trying to work that through in my head. Yeah. Uh, so, quick, quick bit of caveat there. I was asked by the interviewer. <laughs> That's I mean, the not a guy, yes, Medi. You know, how do you consider? No, no. no I, I will clarify. At the time, I was asked, "Is he the great?" I said, "He's the best." I'm surprised that he's the most impressive president of my lifetime. And then the next slide, which is in the piece, was, "But then again." Who's he up against? Ronald yeah. Reagan, George Bush Sr., Bill Clinton, George Bush Jr., Barack Obama, Donald Trump. Not great competition. The bar is very low, but he exceeded that bar. I mean, Barack Obama's probably the only person who comes close. I think he's better than Obama in domestic policy. I was talking very much about his domestic record, and I stand by that. Biden's domestic record is the most impressive domestic record since LBJ. You look at the list, peers, you know it. American Rescue Plan, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Agreement, the Gun Control Legislation, the CHIPS Act, the PACT Act. We could go on and on. Record low unemployment. It's a great domestic record. I can record. feel a but coming, Having really. said that, obviously, the but is October the 7th. Obviously, what he's done uh, on the foreign policy level in enabling Israel's genocide in Gaza, in arming Israel over 100 times, according to the Post, uh, since October the 7th, in giving a blank check to some of the worst fascists in Israel, that will be a stain on his record, on his career, on his presidency for many decades to come. And it's a real problem for a lot of people in this country who supported Biden up until October 7th. I meet many Biden voters. I meet Biden donors who say we cannot vote for him in November. And that is a real problem. So yes, I stand by that headline from last year in domestic policy terms, but overall I would never say that statement again because he's been so disappointing on the biggest moral issue of our time. Many's nuanced take on President Joe Biden's presidency paints a picture of a man caught between significant domestic achievements and controversial foreign policy decisions. 
he credits Biden with surpassing a very low presidential bar set by his predecessors, highlighting substantial legislative victories that he argues make Biden's domestic record impressive. However, many doesn't shy away from critiquing Biden's foreign policy, specifically his administration's role in the Israel-Gaza conflict, framing it as a dark cloud over Biden's legacy. This reflection encapsulates the complexities of political leadership, where domestic triumphs can be overshadowed by international actions, reminding us that a presidency is often a tale of two narratives, the domestic hero and the foreign policy enigma. I also thought the withdrawal from Afghanistan was absolutely disgraceful. And what that did to... Well, we disagree on that. I think it was one of the best things he did. But the way that it was carried out means that basically millions of Afghan women got thrown back to the Taliban walls. How can that be good for them? Unfortunately, there were no good options in Afghanistan. It was America's longest war. We had failed to quell terrorism or defeat the Taliban in those 20 years, as Barbara Lee warned back in 2001. And our presence there was not making things better. If In many ways, it was making things worse. Look, the withdrawal was not great, shambolic in many ways, but I'm not sure there was a way to withdraw that wouldn't have been chaotic. If they'd given lots of notice, there probably would have been an increase in killings. And let's not forget, this was Donald Trump's plan that Biden executed. I'm glad he executed it. I'm glad that Donald Trump promised to pull out of Afghanistan, but Joe Biden did it. He ended America's longest war. He ended America's drone war. Uh, he did a lot of good things on foreign policy until October the 7th. But abandoning Afghan women to the Taliban wouldn't be categorized in my list of good things for an American president to do. There's zero evidence that our presence there would have helped Afghan women in the long term. In fact, Afghan women continued to be killed, maimed, uh, and just have their lives destroyed while America was on the ground in Afghanistan. The question you have to ask, Piers, is how long were we going to stay there? Another 100 years, 200 years? Sometimes you have to stay somewhere a long time to prevent the people who you displaced, coming The longest back. war in American history. Yeah, but the Taliban seized power literally in days, and they immediately dragged those millions of women back to the medieval ages. I mean, things it got immeasurably worse very, very quickly for Afghan women, you know, whether it was school or being allowed out and so on. So it, it, that, to me, is a calculation. If you're an American president, you've got to make that calculation. Does keeping a few thousand troops in a place like Afghanistan prevent the Taliban doing what they've inevitably done from the moment they got power again. I think the few thousand troops were not having an impact. If you look at the stats, peers, uh, civilian casualties were up. Um, the, no, the level of drug production was up. The level of territory control by the Taliban was up. No serious military observer thinks that we were winning in Afghanistan. Many's perspective on the Afghanistan withdrawal highlights the complex, often painful decisions that define foreign policy and military engagement. He argues for the inevitability and necessity of ending America's longest war, acknowledging the messy, chaotic nature of withdrawal but questioning the alternative, prolonged occupation with no clear end in sight. This debate between Mehdi and Pierce encapsulates a broader discussion on the costs of intervention and the challenging balance between strategic interests and humanitarian concerns. Mehdi's stance reflects a pragmatic view of foreign policy limitations, while Pierce focuses on the immediate humanitarian fallout, particularly for Afghan women. Their exchange underscores the dilemmas faced by leaders in navigating the murky waters of international affairs where choices often come with steep and unintended consequences. Should the Democrats win the election in November if Joe Biden insists on being the candidate? I don't quite understand the question. Do you well, I was going to ask you if you think winning? he'll win, but the more interesting question is, should he win? I mean, is it good for America if a guy who is literally almost incapable now of speaking a sentence without making a gaffe or staying on his two feet... Um, should he be the candidate, would that be such a bad thing for America for the next five years that it should render the Democrats so, dis disqualified? So I'm going to agree with you from a different direction. I'm going to say that morally he probably shouldn't be the candidate for president, given what's happened in Israel. A lot of people would prefer he stand aside, given the horrific record over the last few months and the way in which he has as I say, written a blank check to Netanyahu while Netanyahu has carried out what the top court in the world calls a plausible genocide. I think there is a lot of blood on his hands and it would be better for Democrats given you've seen the uncommitted vote, peers in Michigan, in yep. Minnesota, in some of these states. Uh, it could end up costing the Democrats the presidency. So strategically and morally, he probably should step aside, but he's not going to.
is the candidate, whether we like it or not. And the reality is the other candidate is Donald J. Trump, your mm. old friend. And if we're going to talk about mental unfitness, we can't start by talking about Biden. We have to talk about the most mentally unfit person ever to run for any office in the United States, and that is Donald J. Trump. Well, I mean, that, listen, that you're perfectly entitled to your view of him, uh, but the reality is that after four I mean, years of Donald true. Trump's administration... Surely you don't disagree, Piers. Well, I'm going to explain Surely to you... Surely you don't disagree. I'm going to give you some facts about Donald Trump, which are, I think, quite startling, given Please. what you've just said. One is that in, in 2020, nearly 10 million more Americans voted for Trump than first time round after looking at him as president for four years. That would suggest that a lot of Americans simply don't agree with you. Um, secondly, this time round, he's now got Muslim and Arab voters migrating away from the Democrats because of, of Joe Biden towards Donald Trump. And when it comes to the black vote in America, even more extraordinary, according to a New York Times Siena poll released at the beginning of this month, the support among black voters for Trump is now 23%, which is a 19 percentage point increase since the same poll in October 2020. So for the guy who many like you would say is an appalling racist, it seems a lot of non-white people in America rather like what they see and want him back in the White House. Why? OK. So... I mean, you said you're going to deal with some facts. You didn't give me any facts about Trump. You gave me some facts about Trump supporters. Do I deny he has support? Of course not. I spent the last eight years documenting the crazy high levels of support for Trump. And in 2020, it was deeply shocking to see people voting for him after everything they'd seen over the previous four years. And it is very worrying about the trends in American society. And it is a fact that he's a racist. I wouldn't just say, I think he's a racist. He's a racist by any definition of the term. And, you know, you said you're going to give me some facts about Trump. Let me give you some actual facts about Trump and mental fitness. Let's just talk factually. Donald Trump recently confused uh, Nancy Pelosi with Nikki Haley. He claimed he ran against Barack Obama in 2016. He ran against Hillary Clinton. Uh, he thought that we're about to enter World War II. We've actually had World War II. If we enter another World War, it'll be World War III. He thinks you can stop a hurricane with a nuclear weapon. He thinks you need ID to buy cereal. Uh, he thinks you can buy Greenland from Denmark. He thinks England and Great Britain are the same thing. He thinks that stealth bombers are literally invisible. He thinks that you can beat COVID by injecting disinfectant into your veins. The idea the idea that this man should be allowed near a school board is absurd. The idea that he should be allowed near the White House again after everything we know about him? Madness. And in so fact, how, I believe so you how? called him mad after January the 6th. And I agreed with that. I was very critical. Called him mad on I've January been very 6th. critical of him on many occasions uh, when I felt he deserved it. But I've also tried, to, un I've also tried to understand why so many Americans gravitate towards him. And I think what's stark at the moment, if you look at the, the polling for Biden, his approval ratings are shockingly low given who his opponent is likely yeah. to be. Um, but also, particularly amongst Democrats, two-thirds of Democrats don't think he should run again. And they cite his age and physical and mental incompetence yes. as the main reason. I mean, that's the reality. This is why I think for the Democrats, there's a really sharp click ticking clock coming here, isn't there? Where I do think if they persist in having yes. Biden as the nominee, which relies on him, you know, standing down, which I think, don't think he'll do, I think that's how they lose. I think you put almost anybody else in there I mean, against Trump for all the reasons you've just cited, they'd have a much better chance. But you see, here's the problem, Eddie. Joe Biden, necessarily... Joe Biden could not list the things you just listed and remember them himself. So, you know, when he tries to talk about Trump's that's... mental incompetence, he forgets halfway through what he's supposed to be saying. That's the problem. Is Biden gaff prone? Yes, he's been gaff prone for a while. Has it become worse? Clearly, he's old. No one's debating he's old. I think he's trying to lean into his age now. If you look at some of the ads, you look at his mm. State of the Union. He did a very good State of the Union, by the way, with the exception of Gaza. Yeah, it, it was a very bad, strong yeah. and energetic performance. I don't think anyone can deny that. The issue, of course, is we have a media that's singularly unable to cover Trump properly. That's one part of the problem. And, of course, the age issue on the Biden front is a... I've never denied that's a problem. It is a problem. Mm. But the reality is, when you say the Democrats make him... He can't be made to stand down. He's winning primaries. It's a democratic process and he's winning. If people want to run against him, they can. They didn't. And I'm not sure I agree with you when you say another Democrat could beat Trump. If you look at the polling, I think other no, Democrats, I think a the vice chance. president, fair... Well, not according to the polls. The polls suggest people like uh, Vice President Harris lose much bigger to Trump. Oh, no, and let's not definitely forget, not Joe Kamala Biden Harris. One... I'm not on. talking about her. Joe Biden is the one Democrat who's beaten Trump. He did mm. beat Trump. That's you mentioned uh, 10 million more votes for Trump. Mm. He beat Trump by over 8 million votes, I think mm. it was, if memory serves me correctly, mm. in 2020. In fact, Donald Trump has never won a popular vote against a Democrat. He lost to Hillary and he lost to Joe Biden. In this sprawling discussion, many and peers navigate the intricate landscape of American politics.
contrasting the perceived mental fitness and policy impacts of Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Medi articulates a critical stance on Biden's foreign policy while acknowledging his domestic successes, yet underscores the moral and strategic imperatives potentially necessitating a new Democratic candidate. However, when the conversation shifts to Trump, Medi emphasizes his concerns over Trump's suitability for office, citing a litany of controversial statements and proposals to question his mental fitness. Pierce counters with Trump's enduring support among various voter demographics, challenging Medi's criticisms with evidence of Trump's appeal. This exchange encapsulates the polarized nature of American political discourse, where debates over leadership extend beyond policy into questions of character and capability. Many defends the need for consistent, principled leadership, while Pierce probes the realities of political popularity and its discontents. Amidst this, the conversation reveals the deep divides in American society, the challenges of media coverage, and the complexities of voter sentiment as the U.S. grapples with its political future. Talking of votes, um, at the Oscars, Barbie got flatlined by Oppenheimer. You said on MSNBC last summer, these are grown men losing their minds over a movie about a doll. What has happened to conservative movement? There was a time when conservatives talked about taxes, regulation, defense, foreign policy, and now it's just Barbie this, Dr. Zeus that, Bud Light, Mr. Potato Head. Uh, it's childish, ridiculous, pretty pathetic, actually. Um, now, I would take issue with that, because I'm not a conservative, but this whole culture war stuff, I think, is, I think it's very real. Well, no, I'll tell you what I would say. On the pendulum, historically, I've been slightly left to center. I was editor of the Daily Mirror here for 10 years in the UK, as you know, uh, having come from these fine shores. It's a Labour, a Labour supporting newspaper, on, right? Piers. But what's happened is the woke left has you got so... also edited the News of the World, one of yes. the most right-wing publications around. Actually, not under me, but we'll, we can... Because that was, if you may remember, that was an era leading up to Blair, and we were, we were all part of the Blair... Uh, uh, success story. Oh, yeah, story Tony Blair, that famous leftist. Yeah, exactly. But the, the point I'm going to make, though, is that I think the woke left, and I've heard Bill Maher say the same thing and others who consider themselves like me to have been liberals, right? Is that the woke left got so insane that actually people like me and Bill Maher start to sound like we're vaguely conservative, when I don't really have conservative ideology at all. Um, but what I would say is I'm definitely feel more at home with people slightly right of centre than I ever will with the woke left. And this culture war stuff is driven and fueled by the woke left doing bonkers things. Like, for example... That's BS. Well, well give, me, give me an example. BS. Let me give you an example. When you allow biological males, trans women, to compete against biological females at sport at elite level, what you are doing is effectively licensing a form of cheating just as deadly and devastating to the integrity of women's sport as doping. There's no denying it, because if you have a, a biological physiology, so, you have a natural but that's, but that's advantage that's unfair. But that's not what we're talking about. It is but what that's I'm talking, not what about. We're talking about. I'm sorry, I'm not going to let you... No, 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 because... No, you didn't. You just quoted me talking about Bud Light and all the nonsense. If you want to say there's a debate to be had about transgender rights, about bathroom issues, about sports, about where we go, that's a legitimate debate. I've mm. never said you can't have a legitimate debate Do you about agree that. it's wrong? What I am saying, though, is when... Hold, hold on. What, hold on. What I am saying, though... Listen, what I am saying, Piers, is that when you have Fox... And when you have your old, you know, your, 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 your man Rupert Murdoch and his minions pushing these fake culture wars to divide up America. They're not fake culture wars. We have millions of Americans. They're not. Well, they they're, are, Piers. They're not. Millions they're of actually, Hold on, let me finish the sentence. They're actually very me, real. Can I finish the sentence? Sure. Well, let me finish the sentence. I'll tell you why they're not. You should answer when my question. When millions of Americans are living... Oh, I am, if you let me finish a sentence. Millions of Americans are, are living paycheck to paycheck. The climate crisis is destroying the planet. Mm. And you think we should spend loads of hours on Fox, on cable, debating the green M&M's boots? Do you think that's a legitimate time-consuming uh, debate? Yeah, have I thought that a, was a, a, scandal a scandalous state of affairs, actually. Wow. But more importantly... Wow, well, people are starving, people are losing their jobs, people don't have health care, the if climate you, is on not, fire... Eddie. If you, were this. if you were interviewing Again, yourself... The green m and is on. proper journalism. If you were interviewing yourself, what you would now be saying is, Medi Hassan, you wars. have single-handedly refused to answer the original question, which is... Do you, no, you support... Didn't. You said the woke left. You said do the you, woke left. Let me ask you the question the again, because you obviously didn't hear me. Would you su do you support trans women competing in women's sport? Now Piers has got many cornered about his opinions on trans community.
Do I support trans? Yes, under the under the under the correct set of rules. Yes, I do. And I'm not an expert on this subject. What rule? My understanding is what rule that could people possibly like yourself, be correct? Because I believe that the sports bodies who investigate this stuff actually look at, for example, in swimming, what the levels are, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. I'm not an expert on this, but I will tell you this. If you want to have a debate about transgender rights, that's fine. You should have a transgender mm. guest on to discuss it. It's not I my have. expertise, but let me just be very clear. That's not what you asked. You started the question saying you and Bill Maher are not, le you're all lefties mm. who became conservative. You're not, let's be honest. Bill Maher is an old white guy who's had a history of bigotry. He was never on the left. And therefore, I, I do see a lot of old white men who are very uncomfortable with people of color and people who don't look or sound like them asking for rights, asking for space, asking for freedom. And that is the backlash. If you really cared about free speech, you would be going on about the silencing of pro-Palestinian speech on campus, the banning of books in Florida, not the green M&M or Dr. Seuss or all these Fox Murdoch generated fake controversies. But they're not Fox Murdoch generated controversies. They're by yes, the woke they are, left. Piers. No, they no. literally start on Fox. No, they literally no, they start don't. on Fox, Piers. You no. haven't been living here for the they, last few years. I'm telling no, no. you, I've, I've, I've lived you a long and worked in America for 20 years. They, they start with somebody on the woke well, left. Well, I'll give doing... you a long list after well, the show's on. over. I would say they start with somebody on the woke left doing something nuts and playing right into the hands. Yes, some random person who's amplified right. by Fox. Meanwhile, Ron DeSantis gets a pass from you and other journalists for bringing in authoritarian rules in Florida. But people are worried about freedom. But many. Focus on the fascists who are getting rid of our freedom. Right, but it's I think simple. it's... I don't think focus it's, on a random college I think, student with I a placard think, that you don't hang like. Hang on. I think the wokery is a form of fascism. I've said this many times. It's about silencing it's, people it's, that don't agree with you. BS. It's about, in the trans debate, if all the trans debate was about was a, was a right to fairness and equality for trans people, I'm a fully signed up you think, member. Hold, hold on, I just want to be clear here. I want to be clear here. You think... You, I, I want to be clear. I, as I said, I believe they sh we should be able to have a debate about transgender rights, mm. about access, about safe spaces. I believe that. But are you suggesting that transgender people, one of the most demonised minorities facing high rates of violence, are fascists, are a fascist threat to America no. at a time when your friend Donald Trump is an actual fascist? No, no. I'm going to be a dictator. You're misquoting me. Criticizing Trump no, you're misquoting me. I said, I said that when the woke left behave like fascists, which I think they do regularly, because they silence any debate. For you example, think Donald Trump behaves for like example, a fascist, Piers? Well, we're talking about the woke you left. You think Donald now. Trump behaves like a fascist? We've already talked about Donald Why? Trump. Why? Why do you not talk about Donald Trump's fascist? I have talked no, about Donald Trump. You told me how popular he is. I talked you about didn't him. Condemn him. I've talked I about him. You didn't condemn I've him. condemned many things Donald Trump's done. In fact, you cited one of them his earlier. fascism. You cited one of them earlier. I his don't fascism. Think, I don't think Trump fascism. is a fascist. No, no. This marathon dialogue between Medi and Pierce morphs into a whirlwind tour of today's most polarizing topics, from the culture wars and transgender rights to censorship, critical race theory, and the essence of fascism. They volley back and forth, showcasing the complex dance between advocacy, ideology, in the quest for a middle ground in an increasingly divided landscape. No. Wow, but the left transgender activists are fascists. Trump, but actually, Trump who says I'm going to be dictator for I'm a day, I'm talking about why is the woke left, when the woke left wants to suppress free speech, they behave like fascists. When they want everyone to conform to their narrow worldview, and when they want to shout down and silence and suppress debate about, for example, trans athletes competing in women's sports. Who's and been banning it. books in I America? Think, I think the that is a form of fascism. Party. I think that's a form of fascism. Who's been banning books in America, Piers? The woke left or the Republican Party? Actually, historically, both. No, right now, who is banning books across America, according to every I human think a lot of the books. I think a lot of is the books... the Republican are... Party or the woke left? Well, it comes, but it, this comes down to another issue, which is whether you think that children... You can't school... answer a simple question. Well, hang on, which, I'm about to answer. Which I'm group of people are banning books? I'm answering books. a question. I think that when it comes to kids at school, I'm a father of four kids, I actually don't want them exposed to, to graphic stuff in books at school. I don't. And nor do I want them exposed to critical race theory or any of these other things that you think are the, the purview of Fox so, and the right wing. No, I think I'm books not, about MLK right and wing, Rosa Parks shouldn't be banned. As a parent, I think it's fascism. I, as a parent, I think it's fascism I don't think to ban right. books about MLK and Rosa Parks. Sorry? I think we should be able to have books about MLK and Rosa Parks not banned. Absolutely. I think it's pretty fascist to ban Absolutely. books but about kids, Rosa Parks but and But kids Luther should King. not have critical race theory preached at them when they're young. I don't agree with it. Well, there's, there's no critical race theory in American schools, so... You oh, know well, that. there is, and you know there is. No, there isn't. You're Maybe. wrong. You're wrong. Critical race theory is not taught in K-12 through schools in America. You know this. As you it's well a know, university law As you well course. know, there are many teachers in American schools who are teaching critical race theory. 
And that's been a big problem in American true. society. They're also teaching... You'd have to point to me. I also Piers, think... I also Piers, think... We don't, Piers, any time. I'm on, I'm, on, I'm on Twitter. You follow me. Please <laughs> post to me which teacher is post teaching critical I'll race theory. I'll be, I'll I'll be do happy that. to see that. I'll do that after Please this do. interview. Uh, Many articulates a plea for nuanced debate on rights and identities, while Piers navigates the tricky terrain of what constitutes fair play in sports and education. This isn't just a discussion, it's a microcosm of the broader societal debate, echoing the challenges of addressing deeply divisive issues in a way that respects both individual rights and community standards. Amidst the clash of perspectives, the conversation underscores a shared desire for dialogue, even as it reveals the vast gulf that often separates differing views on how to achieve a just society. Mary, I could talk to you for a long time. Uh, I'm great to see you back on the airwaves, great to see you uncensored living up to the, the name on the tin. I wish you all the best with your new media empire and come back soon. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. It's called Zateo and I appreciate the opportunity, Piers. Cheers, Manny. All the best.